What's up, guys? How's your guys Wednesday going? I hope it's going pretty well. Mine's going pretty well because uh, I got back on the field a little bit. and been training some college guys, small groups, obviously. But uh, it's going pretty well. It's going really well. And um, still got it. No big deal. What's up, Jordan? Allison, how we doing? What's up, Brady? Hope you guys are doing well. I'm excited for this one. Um, what's up, Kaya? Hatsky is a awesome dude. Very good friend of mine. Glad he was uh, able to do this. Got a cool story. Um, I'm always, I like these two because I always learn new things as well. Alex, how we doing? Pastor Martinez, welcome. Elise, how's it going? Lisa, Emily, welcome. There he is. What's up, Kim? Getting connected. What's up, Hats? How you doing? Good. I'm turning off the comments. Okay. How's it back in Texas? Hot? Yeah, it's not too bad, actually. We're no. getting some low 90s, which is a nice change. <laughs> from <laughs> high 90s. like 100. Yeah, what's 100. This? What's that? I said hundreds and 110s are brutal with humidity. Yeah, dude. That's <laughs> it's like, do you just not enjoy going outside? Do you, or is it like you have to go outside and like do everything you're going to do outside in one swoop? Because otherwise you have to shower multiple times. Is that how it works? Or what's Yeah, your... I, I have like an hour where, or a mile that I walk my dog in a loop. And some yeah. days that's even that's rough. They they tire out a little bit too. So <laughs> it's, it's and if you're in the sun, you can't you can't deal with it much. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, it's good to see you over the weekend. Yeah, it was awesome to be home in California. Busy weekend? Very busy. Seeing a lot of people, um, got a lot of friends and family there. So trying to spend as much time, see everyone I can, because um, I've been out in Texas now for two years. So Yeah, yeah. How was uh, SAC? SAC was good, too. Got to see some friends, um, kind of figure out my next move moving forward when I finish, uh, finish up here in Texas in about three months. Cool, cool. Um, very exciting. Um, I know some people are going to be joining us as we go, uh, okay. but let's let's just get into it. Um, okay. So first, let's start off. Uh, so for those who don't know, me and Matt played with each other at Santa Clara, and we grew up playing against each other. So let's start there. So yeah. he was a part of this Almanin squad called the Dream Team. Mm -hmm. And this was like back when like the Dream Team was a big thing, wasn't it? Was it like yeah. after oh, that? Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't that, I think, like the 96 Olympics, the dream team, maybe that around that Atlanta yeah. time. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's probably around when our team kind of came came together. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> hated you guys because you guys were called the dream team mainly. And also because you were like our best opponent. It was like, the, it was a good matchup always. Oh, yeah. um, but I remember, so yeah, we had some good matches. I feel like early on, we kind of like, my team kind of had the superiority, superiority, but then like after a couple of years, you guys, no question, we're the better team. And we yeah. just, like, so tell me, I know we've talked about this, but for people out there, like, what are the things that you guys did differently uh, on your team? Yeah, fortunately, I, I was lucky to have this coach. Um, and he very much focused on the technical part of the game. So, you know, I don't know that necessarily we were any, any more athletic than anyone, but we had a, every training session started with 15, 20 minutes of ball work, which I think was pretty much unheard of at that time. And at that age, I didn't know, you know, having played college and higher levels, most people in the U.S. were not doing that. Um, that was not a part of the regular training regimen. And so I think just the technical ability allowed us to um, definitely compete, you know, maybe against teams that are more athletic than us. Um, you know, first touch, trapping, passing, both feet, being comfortable with all surfaces of your feet. So I'm actually you know, it probably projected me and catapulted me into the um, career I eventually had. So I'm pretty grateful for that. Very cool. So that was one thing. And then I know, obviously, you have brothers. So it, mm -hmm. for those don't know, he has an older brother, Nick, who's also a very talented player, and a younger brother, Trevor, who's a very talented player. How did that, like, because growing up with three boys all playing soccer, uh, do you think that affected your, uh, your trajectory as well? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was one-on-one, -on -one, two on ones every day in the backyard. I mean, especially in the summer months. I mean, um, <laughs> till tears were tears and blood were drawn. And, um, you know, it definitely made you more competitive and got to work on the 1v1 aspect and playing against people older and younger than you. And, um, you know, growing up, seeing the career path my older brother took kind of allowed me to kind of follow that and, and 
and figure out how I could do that as well. And my younger brother was very talented as well. So um, kind of all that we were on very, all three of us were on very competitive um, youth soccer teams. Um, I know the, the, how youth soccer is nowadays has changed a lot, but um, you know, we were on the top teams in the area in that time. For those that don't know, uh, like talk about your older brother, because I think that probably helps create your path. Yeah. Um, so my older brother, um, we, we, we all grew up in Almaden and then um, went to Bret Hart and then Bellarmine for high school. And um, so he was one of the few people to make uh, Bellarmine varsity as a sophomore. And then um, his senior year, I was a sophomore in varsity and we got to play together and we both scored winning goal or the two goals. And I think our CCS final, which is a pretty, pretty cool thing. And then he went on to, to UC Berkeley to play college and, you know, for the longest time, I thought that's the route I would go. Um, and join him at Berkeley, join him at Berkeley. And I kind of had this in my mind because I went to Bellarmine that I didn't want to go to Santa Clara. I kind of vowed to not go there. But um, after going to both places on an official visit, I had an opportunity um, to play potentially right away at Santa Clara. And they're coming off a of final four year. And I just liked the small school environment, um, kind of this nurturing um education forward i didn't want to be just a number in a big school and get and get lost potentially in some bigger classes these are the stories you hear about when kind of selecting where you're going to go to college so it was more than just a soccer decision but i think it was kind of driven by the opportunity to you know to at least have the opportunity to compete right away for playing time um and you know also probably at that stage maybe the opportunity to kind of form my own identity i'd always been um, nick's little brother uh, one of his little brothers and um, you know, it was, it was a great experience for sure. Very cool. So obviously Santa Clara, we played together. I transferred mm -hmm. my sophomore year. So sophomore, you freshman through senior, me through uh, senior, sophomore through senior. Um, and then I want to go like, go we'll bypass Santa Clara. Cause I mean, it's like, for me, it's like bittersweet. Cause like we were good, but we were yeah. just so underachieved. So it's, it's always been frustrating <laughs> with that. Um, but you were invited to the combine. So uh -huh. what exactly, what is the combine for those that don't know? Um, and what does that, what does that experience look like? Yeah. So, so fortunately I got invited to the, you know, it was all kind of a result of being, you know, on a very good team, especially, um, all four years we were very competitive at Santa Clara, you know, I'd think in competition for, you know, being one of the top teams in the country, but especially our junior and senior year, we made some runs in the tournament. You know, we had long unbeaten streaks. We had a number of guys go pro through the number of years I was there. So, um, you know, I kind of set goal when, when playing professionally, I thought might be a goal of mine was to get drafted in the super draft and which is the first four rounds. But part of what involves that is before that they have a combine like they do for, I think most professional sports where, you know, in football, they kind of do different metrics like bench press and sprint and all that. But this was an opportunity. Um, I think it was something like maybe 50 or 55 seniors or people entering the draft got invited to Florida. And we flew down there and we were put on um, four teams and we played just maybe I think we played each team um, once. And all the MLS coaches are there. All the scouts are there. Um, it was pretty cool. You got to have meetings. That was kind of a, a different thing. I wasn't necessarily expect, uh, expecting, you know, they kind of get into your psychology and um, how long you plan on doing this and are you committed and, and, and all these different things. So it was a really kind of a, a unique whirlwind experience. I was, I mean, honored to, to go there. Um, great experience. A lot of guys, you know, we played against throughout the years in college, um, but it's also not the ideal environment because you're put on an 11 v 11 and, you have no chemistry with players and you're trying to demonstrate your skills and, and, and whatever that looks like for whatever position you play. So um, trying to stand out with like out doing too much and, you know, so. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Cause soccer is such a team uh, chemistry game. You got to know like your team, know the opponent. And when you're throwing in there, just regular, random people, who knows? Right. Um, okay. So you go to the combine, then what happens next? So um, then the draft, I think at that time, 2008, was, um, I think it was streamed online. That's where I was watching it, except maybe after the first round. So um, I think along the way, I mean, Peter had been drafted. And I, it was it you or Jamil that was next? I can't remember. I don't remember. 
<laughs> but I, uh, I wasn't watching. I was in class. I was like, did not think I was gonna get drafted. I was really in class. Well, yeah, because I, I, I was, I was, uh, I was watching, and they said I, I got excited. It was at Kansas City, and they said from Santa Clara, Matt Marquis. But I was like, oh, <laughs> I mean, I was excited for you, but I was like, oh man, it was pra- It was just kind of you know, I was watching it at home by myself, and then um, in the fourth round, I got I got selected by the LA Galaxy, and it was just kind of like this surreal thing i think uh david beckham had I, I don't know if it was first or second year in the league but i mean that was a huge huge deal um and i remember texting my, i mean i was like so excited i mean it was a goal of mine to get drafted um and you know for my entire career i had so many people to be grateful to get to that point and you know even though i was spent you know at home watching the draft i you know and then, the, then i had this weird thing because i grew up uh you know say i was an earthquakes fan we had season tickets since, you know, 96, the very first season. And, uh, but that didn't really matter to me at that point. I was like, just ecstatic. And, you know, then got, you know, they booked you to go down there for training camp. How, and that's like right away. If those who don't know, you get drafted, at least in the last, wasn't it like two days later or something like that? I yeah. felt like it was, pretty <laughs> it might have been, <laughs> it was, it was pretty close after there. And then, you know, first day in the locker room, all the maybe six or seven of us who got drafted are sitting there and, uh, David Beckham walks in and he, and he goes, hi, I'm David. We're like, <laughs> yeah, we, we, <laughs> we know who you are. <laughs> um, so that was kind of surreal. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. How was that experience with LA? Uh, it was cool. I mean, it was all kind of surreal because it was, you know, at training camp, there'd be paparazzi. And in some ways, I felt like way out of my league, um, trying to show well. You know, I thought my strength... Um, when I was comfortable in an environment, I think my game thrived. Um, maybe certain times like that, it was harder to, to show well. Um, but like the first training session, Ruud Hullett was the coach. And, you know, he's a big time former European p- footballer. And he literally called the first two names were Beckham and Hatsky and then some other names for a six aside tournament. It was just like, like <laughs> I mean, I remember I got like a diving header at the back. I mean, his, he just serves it right on wherever you want yeah. it. <laughs> I mean, not not that I like to head the ball. But you're willing to if he puts it on there. Yeah, if he puts it on your head, you have yeah. no choice. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I was there for maybe five or six weeks. Um, and then, you know, I think I did okay. Probably didn't have my best showing. But um, the GM at the time was Paul Bravo, who was a Santa Clara alum and I knew. And he kind of basically was like, hey, we could sign you to, you know, developmental contract here, or we could look to get you back to San Jose. And that year, San Jose was an expansion team again, because they had been moved to Houston a couple years before. And so, you know, I kind of had a lifelong dream to maybe play for the Earthquakes. Um, You know, I thought maybe I had a better opportunity. You know, they're an expansion side. There's not a lot of established players. There's veteran players who get drafted there in the expansion draft, but um, I thought maybe my chances were better there. Plus, plus being home and, and, and doing that, I thought was maybe a better option for me um, professionally soccer wise. Got it. So then basically you're just like, all right, yeah, I'll go back to San Jose. And then you already have a slot on San Jose when you're back because it's expansion team or how'd that work? No, you know, they, I kind of went on trial with them and then they had to figure out if they wanted to trade my rights or I don't know if like LA had to sign them away, but eventually they traded my rights for like a supplemental pick. Uh, and it was pretty cool because Jamil had been originally drafted to Dallas and didn't work out there. And then he and I both came back to San Jose around the same time. And, it, you know, that's actually, I don't know, I just started killing it there. Um, I thought I was training really well. I think I was more comfortable. Um, but, yeah, I, I think I, I had a good showing there. And then they eventually decided to, you know, sign me to a developmental deal and, and kind of see how that goes. So for those who don't know, like, real quick, describe, like, the roster of MLS. You're saying developmental. What does that mean? Yeah, and I don't know if it's actually this way anymore, but in 2008, there was maybe 18 or 20 full senior roster spots and maybe another 8 or 10 um, developmental contracts, which were mostly guys coming out of college um, because there actually used to be a developmental league before I think they partnered with the USL. So what we would do, you know, everyone would basically travel to the games and the first teams would play. Those would be the ones in the main stadiums. And then um, the reserves, people, so they don't just get no, so they don't, so they can get some game action. Um, There was actually a league where you play either the next day, um, you know, some vet guys who are rehabbing would would play in the developmental league. And, um, you know, it was kind of like 
not maybe a little above the minor leagues relative to baseball because you're right there and always on call. But um, yeah, so it's kind of like just a farm system that's readily available, but anyone, you know, you can play at any point. Um, yeah, so for those that don't know, again, so it's like 18 to 20 on the full-time roster, and you have another 8 to 10 on developmental. So the whole, I think the whole team is like 28 guys around yeah. that. And I think um, then there was only like 12 or 14 teams. So, I mean, the number of number of slots to fit in, um, you know, in the MLS at that time is very limited. And I, I remember being in L.A. and the amount of players they cycled through, mainly internationals, I was just like floored crazy. like – every week three or four new guys and three or four new guys out. And it was just like, you know, it's a different level when you're not just competing against, you know, college guys you are competing against, you know, potentially anyone in the world who wants to play professional soccer. Yeah. That was definitely something. I remember my second year in Kansas city when we didn't make the playoffs every week, they'd bring in like seven to 10 guys. And yeah. the guys who were like older were kind of like already done, like the veterans, meaning who on the team, they didn't train. But at that point, it was like anyone under 25, like your spots on the line, pretty much. And even yeah. some of the older guys, too. Um, yeah, so that was so, so basically how it works is because I don't know is uh, in preseason and during the season, they can bring in players whenever they want. So they just bring in players and train and they can give them two, three, four, five, six, seven days. And they can just do that all year long if they want. Obviously, can kind of mess up team chemistry if you do that too much. Um, but in preseason, yeah, it's fair game. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, San Jose, tell me yeah. about how the year went and anything else? Yeah. So, the year, it was interesting. I mean, fortunately, in my career, I'd always been on winning teams, college, growing up and everything. And we were an expansion team, so we experienced a lot of losing. Um, also, in, you know, I had periods I thought right at the start I was actually playing my best and was hoping to get an opportunity. And you know, found myself on the bench or not even dressing. So, you know, you can only dress 18 players for a game out of your roster of 28. So, um, you know, didn't initially start on, even on the bench, wasn't even dressing, kind of learning what that meant and trying to figure out how to be consistent and, and professional. And it's, it's, a, it's a big step and a big challenge and sometimes not as much of a, a warm and fuzzy of a team camaraderie as you do in youth soccer or even college. And, you know, it's a little more, it's people's livelihood and career. So that's a challenge. And then I actually got an opportunity in the middle of the year to play with the U S futsal team. And in 2008, the world cup was going to be held in Brazil. And um, so I actually things at this time, things were not, I was like, maybe on the bench, not looking even close to get to the squad. Um, don't remember how I was playing or what I was feeling at the time, but I had an opportunity to go to these couple training camps and one was in uh, Brazil and Miami. And so I was like, I'm just going to do this. I, you know, it's a pretty cool opportunity. So went down there. Um, incredible experience. A lot of, I think probably the biggest name player was DeMarcus Beasley's brother was kind of the, the big time on the, the futsal team. And then I came back and I had actually started I thought doing really well, kind of getting close to scratching the surface, maybe going to get some playing time. And then the CONCACAF qualifiers came up um, for the World Cup, which was in, I think, Guatemala or Honduras. I can't, I, I don't remember. But so I was invited to go back with the national team and I elected not to because, you know, I, I, I was an outdoor player. That was kind of what my uh, career ambition was. Um, so I thought this might be my chance. Um, and so fortunately the u.s team eventually qualified and then um i got to go to another camp um where i think we played japan a few times in milwaukee this is futsal, futsal. futsal national team. yeah yeah so then but then i ended up not making the the u.s u.s team so um i think ultimately it came down to the decision not to go to the Concacaf qualifiers and they took the guys who qualified so mm -hmm. you know it was a it was a calculated decision i don't i don't regret it um obviously bummed that that didn't happen but um you know it was also kind of one foot in it was not being fully committed to either which it's very hard to be successful at anything unless you're fully committed to something so it was kind of a, it was a good life lesson I, t I took from it as well okay when did that when did that whole run finish with the u.s futsal team you know so the mls season essentially is most of the year it's probably you know february for training camp all the way through October, November. Yep. So I think I think it was more mid, maybe the summer. Okay. It was, yeah. When you came back and you were flatly doing like you're doing well with the quakes, like mm -hmm. 
let's go from there. Like, did they talk to you like, hey, you kind of abandoned us a couple weeks, ago, like a couple months ago at all? Did they say anything like that? No, the, I don't. Animosity. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I felt maybe some weirdness with uh, maybe some of the players, but I, I uh, there was kind of this maybe awkwardness, but I don't know. I, I was, I wasn't quite sure. Um, it's funny, even getting back into, I, I kind of originally only wanted to try to play professionally for a couple of years. That was kind of my goal. And, you know, in, in retrospect, you're not going to make it if, if that's your goal. You yeah. Know? Why, what was it? Uh, why, was, why do you think that? Well, like, what was your mindset? One of the big things was, you know, at the time, you didn't make any money playing soccer. And by any money, I mean, it's like comical. But, you know, it was such a cool opportunity and something you got to, to do. And I remember, you know, we had a big party at Santa Clara after all four of us got drafted. And people come up to you like, you're set for life. I'm like, you have no idea. <laughs> you literally have no idea. Um, but, yeah, so I was like, okay. That was a big part of it. And then the other the other big part of it, and I think we'll get into more of this later, was like I was not out um, um, publicly, you know, being gay. And um, the longer that went on, it, it wore on me. And I wasn't happy. And it, maybe I wasn't happy because I wasn't playing. But, I, you know, as it as it kind of wore on, it it it, it was like I, I cannot be in this career long term or even Why? short term, potentially. You know, at the time... So 2008, it was, you know, it's only 12 years ago, but it's a little different time than it was now. There weren't, you know, many out people in general publicly, let alone out athletes um, and out soccer players. So I think kind of one of the only, I swear, one of the only people I remember being out publicly was like Ellen DeGeneres. Um, but, you know, it's um, probably for a lot of kids you coach, they're growing up in a time, the society views have um, evolved and quite rapidly in, in, in what some ways if you look at it but over a long time if you look at it in other ways you know um, you know gay marriage passed only five years ago um, in all 50 states as a federal protection and law and then even just like two weeks ago um, it would be a federal protections that you can't can't be fired for being LGBT um, and, that, and it surprises <laughs> yeah it surprises a lot of people you know I think there was 30 states where it was still legal to fire someone for being LGBT. So, you know, um, yeah, it's, the, I think, so those were the two main factors. One, I didn't want to, I, there was no money in it. And I thought um, at the time there was something maybe better I could do with my life and um, to kind of, being closeted and long, I can't keep living like this. I have to figure out my, my personal life to be happy long-term. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so how did you step away? Like what did the end of the year look like? Yeah. You kind of like make that decision and you're like, all right, I'm done and going to move on. Yeah, um, no, it, was, it wasn't like that. And I think, um, you know, I think I went through the year and I think I, did, you know, I did okay. The rest of the season didn't make appearances on the first team. Um, came back into training camp and, you know, was kind of feeling a little rejuvenated, like, hey, you know, I got a year under my belt. Maybe I can, um, maybe I can crack the first team, you know, at some point. Maybe this is the year I'll, I'll get the opportunity. Um, and then, I don't remember what day, maybe, I think maybe the combination of maybe not being committed from the year before and doing that futsal thing, and maybe I wasn't as committed mentally anymore, too. Uh, I actually got cut, and, um, you know, I, I really liked uh, Frankie Alp was the coach. He was a great guy, and, and basically they're like, you know, we're going to move on. You know, they basically draft a whole new crop of these players who they're going to pay what they paid you, and not that I was going to get any more, and, you know, I, I don't think it was an unfair decision looking back at it. And they were like, do you want to go to Seattle or Vancouver? And, uh, you know, at the time they were not MLS teams, Um and I think I just needed to, like, take a step back. And it, it was kind of this – it came to this realization, like, like they had to cut me for soccer. I, for some reason, I, like, couldn't quit soccer on my own. But I felt like their cutting me allowed uh, – gave me the release and freedom to try to figure out, um, you know, my personal life, how to be happy, um, what that looked like, and, and how, how I'm going to, you know, 
live beyond, you know, just soccer. You know, you spend this long playing soccer, it becomes a part of your identity. And um, not even just, not even being gay was an issue. I mean, I have a lot of friends and people who played soccer in MLS for one or 10 years. And um, when you step away, pro athletes or even college athletes or high school athletes, it's a, it's a big identity crisis. And, and okay, I've always identified as a soccer player. So what am I without it? And it, if you played and trained at a high level and, even college, like I said, college pros, it's, it's a, it's a big identity challenge. And, um, you know, I'm sure maybe even you went through some of that too. And kind of most people I know when they're done playing, it's like, okay. <laughs> no, no, I, I think you're completely right. Um, and I think it's not just athletes. It's just people in general. Mm -hmm. It's like, Hey, when you ask people to party or something, you mean, Hey, what do you do? Like the first thing they think about is like, what's your occupation and right. that's their identity. Versus like, no, like, like, what do you do? Like, what type of person are you? Right. What, kind of, what are the kind of things you enjoy doing? What kind of hobbies you have? Like, I don't know. I always thought that was interesting. People yeah. say like, what do what you do? I was like, I like to have fun and hang out with my friends and stuff. And they're like, no, what do you do for work? It's, oh, what do you do for work? Oh, okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Like, I've heard, I've heard of like a better question when you ask people like, what do you, what do you like to do when you're not working? You know, cause yeah. that, no one asks them that. Everyone always asks, what do you do for work? Cause it's an easy jumping off point, but you know, and some people could be passionate about their work and hopefully you have some level of that, but like hopefully you have other things in life too. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. So now you've been removed from soccer. What does it look like going forward? Like you're not out yet, are you? No. So that was like 23. Um, so how many years after? So four years after that. I was when did you realize like you were gay? When did that realization happen? So it's easier to look in retrospect. I think in a certain way, I think I've always known. But, um, you know, puberty and, and you know, I, in a way, I always knew I was different than my friends, but I couldn't, like, I couldn't pinpoint it. I can look back now and say, oh, that makes sense. I could probably say since, like, I don't know. In some ways, like I said, always some ways, maybe, like, early elementary school. But um, it's, such a, it's such a bizarre thing because it was, there was no prevalence in society, no, pu no public, uh, no publicity in society about it. So, um, you know, there's, so even though I was 23 and then I didn't come out till 27. Um, yeah, I just, so like back to your question in some ways always. And in some ways, maybe probably like kindergarten, early elementary. Okay. There was something different. I could never put my finger on it till I was older. And then I realized what it was. And then once you realized it, like, that's a long process. Like what allowed you to get there? Yeah. So I think ultimately it, I had to accept myself first as being gay. It, and that was the hardest one. Um, you know, I wasn't a religious person or anything, but I remember <laughs> trying to pray it away in myself or like making a deal or, you know, I mean, I definitely, fortunately, you know, I come from a, a supportive family and, you know, not necessarily, um, we don't, we aren't, we're not religious upbringing, but I went to Catholic high school and college and um, yeah, it's just, I'd say the journey to self-acceptance was the most challenging. And, and I think the major challenge is I didn't have uh, an example in society of someone who looked like me, was an athlete. Yeah. You know, I think we all need, you know, think leaders who can inspire us to kind of be the next person and um, kind of realizing the prevalence, um, uh, how, how prevalent LGBT people are as I got older kind of really helped me. Got it. So would you say that, like, what were the factors that helped you come out and what did that kind of look like? What did coming out look like? That's not, yeah. Like, how, how, how yeah. You do? do you just like come out there <laughs> to your parents and be like, I'm gay. Or like, right, right. <laughs> like, so one of the actually, one of the actual major factors of coming out more publicly was um, Robbie Rogers, who played for the U S national team. He had a career with MLS for a long time. Um, played in Europe and he came out publicly and I just, it was like a light bulb went off. It was like, ding, ding, ding. This is what I had been looking for. Someone whose story is similar to mine. Um, so I was like, okay, then I can do it. But it was, a, it was a process of coming out. I probably came out to the very first person besides myself at 25. So uh, late bloomer, obviously compared to some other people, but I know people who've done it much later in life. Um, so 25. And then I was like, okay, one of the, in between finishing playing soccer, I started taking classes to go to dental school. And um, 
so as I, I was going to go to dental school, I went to dental school in San Francisco. Um, you know, I was kind of finally away from home. I was in a, you know, obviously one of the more notoriously LGBT friendly cities. It was kind of my goal to be out when I was in dental school, but I started that at 25. So that didn't happen, obviously, um, because I said it didn't come out till I was 27. So it was still quite a process because I, I didn't talk much about soccer in general, but I, I found it as an easy deflector that, you know, when people wanted to get to know me, I could be like, oh, you know, I played soccer. But I, I didn't tell a lot of people about it. I used it, used it for, like, essays and applications to get into <laughs> higher education and stuff. But beyond that, <laughs> most, people, most people never know. And then somehow one person tells them, like, I can't believe you didn't know that or do that. And I'm like, in a lot of ways, it feels like a lifetime away. And I, I, in a lot of ways, I don't even identify as a soccer player anymore. I mean, I'm still – tons of friends involved in it and um it just feels like a, a different life because it kind of was for me it was a, it was kind of this two two-way life and you know seemingly happy person but also you know who who dealt with a lot of you know depression and anxiety and and how how to resolve how to resolve this and how how to figure out to be a, a happy healthy adult living you know um a healthy life mentally emotionally physically all these things so you're 25, dental school, still aren't out. Mm -hmm. How did you get there? Like, what was... You know, I, I had told some close friends. Um, I, I told one close friend, one of my best friends in dental school, kind of right from the beginning, because I was like, this is kind of my goal. And then I don't know what stopped it. I think it might have been the soccer identity might have stopped it. You know, I'm like, well, people, you know, know that I am played soccer um, at some level professionally. And so maybe I still wasn't ready at the time. And, you know, and then it comes back to um, all these things, societally subtle and overt homophobia that I'd heard throughout my lifetime. And that's not even just from, you know, kids at school. It's from, you know, in a locker room, growing up on the field, you know, it was very common, I think, you know, 20 years ago, for people to use homophobic slurs. And I think it's become not as common and it's definitely more frowned upon. Like uh, it's a little more taboo to use, you know, gay slurs to, to try to insult people. So that, and, you know, like I said, gay marriage passed five years ago. That's, that's not even, um, <laughs> that wasn't even a reality. You know, I was having a hard time figuring out okay, coming out, yes, but how do I get to live a life that is full? Meaning, you know, if you want to have a relationship and kids and you want to go into certain professions, you know, and I'm, I was aware that you could be fired, maybe not necessarily in California at the time, but you could be fired in a lot of states for just being gay or you could never get married or you might never have kids or all these things. And so I think battling with those demons versus, all right, I'm just going to live my authentic life kind of no matter what. And being in San Francisco um, and meeting people kind of allowed me to um, see that that was more possible. And, you know, fortunately in dental school, uh, I developed a very uh, close knit group of friends. I know it has always had long term friends, like from childhood, you know, even though we played against each other, we've known each other for forever. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that's all part of it. All these things are holding me back. And then, um, so 27, I came out, I feel like, you know, the people, the few people I were out was out to, they just continued to encourage me and support me. Um, and I think I had reached a certain point, like if someone just asked me, I would have said yes, but you know, I could use an excuse that they're asking the wrong question. It's like, do you have a girlfriend? I could just say no, and I don't have to elaborate, but it's another thing you have to realize. It's like, it is all consuming. It weighs on your mind like 24 seven. So it just, um, at a certain point just exhausts you. And, um, you know, you can only, you can kind of only take it so much. And then fortunately I had this like, so when I was 27, I came out and I think, um, California repealed prop eight, which was against gay marriage. So then it became legalized in California. That was two years still before, um, the national recognition of it. So there was a huge celebration um, in San Francisco and I like never felt more alive. It was just like, 
an amazing time to be there. I was in my first relationship. Um, I finally saw what can be possible. You know, all my friends still accepted me and all of these things. And, 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 you know, I'm, I consider myself one of the lucky ones. I honestly can say, I don't think I had any negative reaction. And I, I think it's hard for my friends and family to even understand like, well, what did you think? And I'm like, if, if it was that like 0.001% chance that, you know, someone would accept me or reject me, that it wasn't, it wasn't worth it for uh, that risk. Um, so, yeah. Once you were out, like that, that whole weight that you were talking about, was that kind of just relieved or was it, did it change? Yeah. So the thing I learned is you never stop coming out. Like even now, um, I, I still am conscious of it. I don't, you know, it's not the first thing I say about myself anyways, but, uh, you know, conversation come up, you know, in professional settings and, you know, I've become more comfortable, um, with, with telling people, but I, you know, um, I don't tell everyone, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a dentist, I'm an endodontist, which is a root canal specialist. I'm in my residency down in Texas. And, you know, I have a lot of pa patients who will, you know, they have good intentions, but they'll bring you like a, a, a Jesus pamphlet, I call it, I don't know, they leave it on there. And I'm like, you know, so they ask, you know, do you have a wife? I just say no, and kind of move on. But <laughs> um, so then the other part of my coming out was like, okay, you know, I still like deal with coming out on, on an almost daily basis and, and how much to reveal. And, you know, I've gotten to the point where if I'm in a professional setting, and people are talking about their significant others, I, I do as well. And I, um, I'm a lot more comfortable with that. But like I said, there's still situations and settings I, I don't. Um, but then I think when I was 29, I think it was then, um, one website I had always looked at was called outsports.com. And it was kind of this, they did all these different stories about various athletes. You know, there'd been a couple NBA players, um, Jason Collins, who came out after he retired. A few football players, I think, had come out. Um, and I had reached out to them, and I was kind of thinking about it. I was like, you know, kind of my hope was to eventually maybe be a role model that I wish I had had when I was younger. So while I'm not like a super public person, it was kind of a challenge for me um, to do this. But I, I came out kind of in a very public way. I wrote an article. Um, it was in the newspaper. It was on TV. NBC Barrier News like interviewed me. And um, so like then it was like, okay, there's like, <laughs> <laughs> there's like no, um, no coming back. And, yeah. you know, when you go on interviews or whatever in the rest of your life, you Google my name, it's like Matt Hatsky gay. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> you just have to be comfortable with that. And like, like I said, if I can help one kid or one person out, um, then, then it's worth it to be out in this public way. Because, you know, after that, I got to go on this kind of whirlwind tour. I got to do different speaking engagements, um, Nike flew me up to Portland for their LGBT World Cup that, you know, it's hosted in different cities around the world. Um, they flew me up to speak with this trans transgender woman who played for the Samoan national team. And so, you know, we've got to do different question and answer sessions. I got to speak at, um, they do some out sports reunions every year and I, get to, I got to speak there one time. Um, so I kind of came to this realization that uh, visibility was the key. You know, I think for young LGBT people, it was important to see um, not just professional athletes, but you have to see LGBT people in all professions, you know, all walks of life. So whatever you want to do, you can do. I mean, and then the other thing is LGBT people look like, you know, everyone else. There's a, it's a, it's a rainbow, you know, <laughs> it's all different walks of life, um, you know, knows no boundaries you know so it was kind of this this whirlwind for a while and um you know i felt like i got to use my platform how i wanted to in terms of like being as visible as i could and while still trying to be you know comfortable and um you know because it, it's like i said i'm mostly i'd say more private person so yeah part of that was a little challenging, but I, I learned a lot from it. I gained a lot from it. I, I grew a lot from it. So I was uh, also grateful for those opportunities. Those are a lot of very cool experiences. 
and uh, a lot of knowledge. What would you like with all the knowledge and experiences you've had, what would you tell to a kid maybe who's like questioning their sexual identity? Um, what any sort of advice you'd give them? Yeah, I think there's a lot more resources to reach out to. And I think my, my hope and my perception is that the younger generations, at least a little more accepting and it's, um, uh, you know, not any more prevalent, but it's more visible. So I think, you know, I always, you know, you can give up either my, they can either message me on Instagram if anyone's watching this and want to, or look at those websites or, you know, kind of most cities have a um, LGBT center. Uh, it's also, you know, important to learn about our history and, and where we came from and, you know, kind of the struggle because fortunately they grew up in a time when it's, you know, it's been a lot of good news in terms of LGBT rights, yes. but there's still, there's still a lot of, um, you know, unfortunately people that are attacking those rights um, today. Um, so it's, it's an ever, uh, it's an ever evolving battle that hopefully continues to get better for everyone in the long run, but you know, it's, it's, it's not over. And so I think, you know, finding you know if you're struggling with it finding a confidant finding that one person to talk to about it because once you can get outside yourself it really helps but you know first and foremost you have to accept yourself and you know it is a journey i mean everything we see in society is man and woman um and so if it doesn't quite fit that mold it's it's you're like how do how do i fit in and and what does that look like and um you know teenage years are hard I think for everyone anyways, and it's just uh, another challenge. But, um, you know, when I look back, I wouldn't change it for anything. I, you know, I think that was a very, you know, good realization I came to, you know, later in life, you know, at first I wish I wasn't. And then, you know, to be proud of it and, you know, do what I can to continue to, you know, move it forward and be visible, like, you know, like my goal was and hopefully reach even one person okay now let's flip it other point of view what would you tell friends or family members of somebody who they suspect maybe um, of being lgbt yeah so i think this is interesting because like i said i reached a point one time where um if someone asked me i think i would have said yes so sometimes we um one time it's not even like don't ask someone if they have a boyfriend or girlfriend. You can ask someone if they're dating someone. Uh, that can be a little more inviting. I think, you know, in the soccer world or any world, you know, being very careful and cognizant if you or friends are using, you know, derogatory homophobic slurs. I, like I said, I hope and think those have gone by the wayside a little bit, but, um, you know, there might be slips here and there. And, um, you know, it's they're used to demean and make less than and, uh, you know, make people feel less than and, you know, obviously, because some people have the view that LGBT people are less than. So, you know, really being careful with those words, but, you know, just kind of being a sounding board coming at it in a, in a softer, softer way, because the person might not be ready. But like I said, when people ask me if I have a girlfriend, I said, No, that was an easy answer. But, you know, maybe, and it's going to take a little, it's not going to happen quickly. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, yeah, I think those are kind of be my main suggestions. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well, um, super useful. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to, you want to get across? No, I think, uh, I think it's, I'm happy you gave me the opportunity to do this. You know, June is LGBT uh, yep. Q pride month and, you know, celebrations are a little different this year and which is, which is good. Um, people always have the pride. I just want, if anyone watches this and wants to reach out, you can message me on Instagram. I'd be happy to chat, provide resources. Um, you know, the amount of people and connections and opportunities I've gotten from just being, um, public in this little way has, has been amazing. And I think, you know, if you are struggling, you know, there's always the saying it gets better and, you know, you just got to find, you got to figure out how to get through the hard times and hard times like happen for everyone, but this is another obstacle we might find. But um, no, I think it's important. I think, you know, even everyone, 
allies and straight people should learn a little bit about LGBT history. And, you know, it's, it's very enlightening for people to realize that, um, you know, it was only two weeks ago that, L, you know, LGBT yeah. can't be fired for being their, you know, identity in this country. And, something as simple as um, donating blood historically gay men have been banned from donating blood and they they've softened the rules but there's still rules against it and you know most of my friends and family are not aware of these things and obviously you know when crises happen we'd all like to donate but it's you know it's like how are you going to compromise yourself too much so i think you know reach out learn everyone's got to do their part to kind of make the world a better place any way you can, you know, be a little more understanding, you know, in the, on the soccer field specifically, careful of, uh, careful of slurs, you know, get them out of your, get them out of your vocabulary. Um, and then, you know, if you have friends who you think may or may not be, maybe use a little different language and, you know, are you dating someone versus do you have a girlfriend, boyfriend specifically assigning a, uh, you know, a gender to, to someone who they, they might be interested in. Okay. Good stuff. Hats, appreciate it. Yeah. Looking forward to you get back in California. When am I going to see you again? Like, what, three months or so? Three months. Hopefully okay. a little less. Maybe I'll come back for a weekend. Hopefully we'll have a, we'll, hopefully we'll have like a legit party when we yeah. get back. Seriously. Stay safe. Thanks. Enjoy All Texas. Right. All right. Take care. See you, Hats. Bye. Bye.